Yeah. She'll throw in the mid-60s, going to be more down in the zone with her drop ball and changeup, kind of using her as an opener today in Game 2 of this Georgia series. She will take on Lindy Ray Davis, who looks at a ball low and outside. Davis has been terrific in the leadoff spot, moved to that position on March 8th and has not relinquished it since. He's done a phenomenal job setting the table for a Georgia lineup, Amanda, that looked unbeatable through even the first weekend of conference play when they took two or three against Alabama. They have struggled a bit since, including last night. Just one run against Carlin Pickens. Orsini has not allowed an earned run in her last three outings. Six and two-thirds innings pitched over that stretch. And a 2-2 count against the leadoff woman, Lindy Ray Davis. Well, and you know, if we were surprised about Orsini starting, <laughs> I have a feeling maybe Georgia was a little bit surprised as well, expecting Gottschall here in game two. And, and a strikeout on the first at bat. Gets Davis looking one down. Yeah, able to mix that change up and her drop ball within this at bat. Paints the outside corner with her drop ball and Rossini fired up to get the start. Her first start in SEC play here on a beautiful Saturday in Knoxville. Karen Weekly throwing a little curveball to Tony Baldwin. Upstairs to Sarah Mosley. who has led this team in RBI second in the SEC as you get a look at the Georgia lineup. It has been relatively unchanged since March 8th on a ground ball to third. And an easy play from Gibson, two down. Well, Mosley back on March 8th moved into the two spot. She had hit in the leadoff and in the six. So Tony Baldwin making a couple of changes back on March 8th. We've seen relatively the same lineup since with Jada Kearney batting in the three hole. And Tony Baldwin's team coming off a pretty surprising series loss against Arkansas at home. Dropped two of three to the Razorbacks and they lacked timely hitting. And frankly, that's what they lacked last night in game one. And Arkansas looked really good in that series. And that was a home series for Georgia as well. So dropping a series to Arkansas. When going into that series, you I think a lot of people expected Georgia to take that series against Arkansas. But man, Arkansas had a great game plan. That is a rocket up the middle by Jada Kearney. And a two out single keeps the inning alive now for Jaden Goodwin. Kearney looking down in the zone, knowing the game plan against Orsini, and she gets a change up out over the plate. That was supposed to be on the inside corner. Instead, it was out over the middle of the plate. Orsini whew, had to defend herself and kind of <laughs> a little dodgeball there. Kearney, that's the ball so hard. Kearney now an 11 game hitting streak has been so hot for this Georgia team, who yesterday was 0 for 10 with runners on. And they changed that here early against the Tennessee team that jumped on them in the first inning in game one. Pitches in the inning now for Charlie Orsini. Seven balls, six strikes, and again has not allowed an earned run in over seven innings of work now. Backhanded it short. Mueller on the first in time, and Orsini pitches are active. And Laura Mueller takes the first pitch strike from Madison Kerpix. Mueller has had a Remarkable turnaround at the plate. Her March, she might have been the hottest hitter in the lineup after really struggling in February. 
and has done a nice job setting the table for a Tennessee team that ran the table in March. 20-game win streak for the Vols, the longest in the country. It was snapped last weekend in a game three loss to Auburn. Well, and there have been a couple of surprises for Georgia as Kerpix gets a strikeout indeed on that changeup. But it's that they didn't have to face Kiki Malloy yesterday as the leadoff hitter, and they don't have to face her face her again today. So Laura, Lauren Mueller, excuse me, Laura Mueller, the leadoff hitter for the past two games last night and today because Kiki Malloy, a lower body injury that she sustained at practice day to day. She had started 210 games in a row in center field in that leadoff spot for Tennessee. So Tennessee trying to find a way offensively without her, the All-American, who we will not see, well, potentially not see today. And Alana Leach getting the start in center field in place of Malloy, her second start ever in SEC play. Well, they looked pretty good at the plate yesterday without Kiki Malloy. Home run in the first by McKenna Gibson to give them a 2-0 lead. They scored five unanswered out of the gate against Georgia. And I think that's what Georgia, in order to get back on track, is going to want to do, is limit the amount of damage that a team is putting up against them early on in the game, in the first inning, second inning. 2-1 to Pooney. Georgia pitching has given up 10 home runs in SEC play. Seven of the 10 have come in the first or the second innings. Mm. Saw that in game three against Arkansas last weekend. Got down early in that game. Payoff pitch to Pooney coming. And a one out walk drawn by the Tennessee first baseman. Well, and I think that's probably what was most frustrating about last night's home run, too. The McKenna Gibson home run in the first inning off of Lily Backus is it was a two run home run, but the runner that was on base got there via a walk. So these home runs are going to happen. In fact, they've given up several solo home runs in SEC play, but that, you want to keep it a solo home run and not a multi run home run. Keep yourself in the game. As we showed you in the open, it was McKenna Gibson who got the scoring started for Tennessee in this nearly exact same spot. Bottom of the first, runner on, and a two-run bomb to left field. All SEC first teamer a season ago and has picked up right where she left off last year early in 2024. Gibson in the right field. And Kearney makes the catch, leaping in the air just ahead of the warning track, two down. Such a good swing by McKenna Gibson, who has been so hot in SEC play. And Jada Kearney out in right field has seen a lot of balls come her way and has stepped it up defensively, quite frankly, in right field with the plays that she's been making the past couple of SEC series. Read that one well, stretched right at the right time to get that important second out. So two down and a runner at first for Riley West. Who is having a career year at the plate. In her final season here in Tennessee. And we asked Karen Weekly, you know, what, what's been the catalyst? Because oftentimes, Amanda, you do see players over the course of their careers, the good ones, make steady improvements. But she has had a massive improvement at the plate and Karen told us she just finally committed to playing free and it's completely changed not only who she is as a player but as a person in the clubhouse for this Tennessee team
Takes the 2 1 in the left field and down for a base hit. 2 1 and 2 out now for Destiny Rodriguez. Well, and a couple of early adjustments, too, off of Matty Kerpix's changeup. Throwing it in a backwards count here, meaning in a hitter's count, and Riley West is able to identify it, pick it up out of her hand, and hit it hard over to the left side of the field. So already in the first inning, Tennessee picking up on that Kerr picks changeup and hitting it hard. Here is Rodriguez. And a first pitch strike from Kerpix. Nobody throws more changeups in the country than this Georgia pitching staff. But perhaps nobody in the country has been hitting it better than Tennessee. Yeah, and it seems like maybe even it's potentially that Tennessee's hitters or their dugout have picked up on it. It seemed like that was another changeup right there, too. And when Kerpix was in her delivery, it sounded like there was some noise, some signs coming from the Tennessee dugout relaying that to their hitter. Pop up, right side, behind home plate, and out of play. You know, it's so interesting you bring that up because when we had a chance to talk with Karen Weekly, you asked her, you know, what's been what's been successful for your offense this year? And she said, when we've been at our best, we've been really good communicators. Hitters coming back into the dugout, telling the next batter or the next couple of batters what they're seeing at the plate. One, two, flare in the left field. Armistead is back on it and called off by Jaden Goodwin. And Kerpix pitches around a walk and a two out single. No score after matchup between Tennessee and Georgia this weekend. As Sidney Chambly leads it off and rips it past the shift for a leadoff single. So back to back innings to start the game with singles for the Georgia Bulldogs. And you can see that Kutsoyanopoulos again was set up on the outside corner. That pitch bleeds back out over the middle of the play, kind of even more toward the inside corner. Chamley gets a mistake, hits it hard the other way. And now Sidney Kuma again with a corner infield drawn in. And that did not hit the bat and the runner advances. That's heads up base running by Sidney Chambly, moving into scoring position. Could have been even the bat that got in the eyes of Kutsoyanopoulos as Kuma pulls back. Mishandled though, and Chamley able to get herself in a scoring position. And the best part about that is that you don't have to waste Sydney Kuma laying down a bunt and sacrificing her over. Now you have her in scoring position with multiple chances to get her around. And Emily Digby on deck, who homered last night for Georgia, the lone run scored by the Bulldogs in game one. And again, we talked about it last inning. But Georgia in SEC play, particularly last night and in the Arkansas series, struggling to manufacture runs with runners on base. Kuma. <laughs> Kuma thought there was four balls there. I had to double check myself. Three and one count. Charlie Orsini in her first SEC start. Two on to start the second inning for Georgia. You mentioned that home run that Georgia hit last night. Their home run was off the bat of the freshman, Emily Digby, off of Carlin Pickens, whose ERA is basically minuscule this year as a sophomore. So the freshman getting the most of one of the best pitchers in the nation. That's why I think that Megan Rhodes-Smith is going to come out and talk to Charlie Orsini and the Tennessee defense, trying to get on the same page, knowing that Digby's been looking good at the plate. Carlin Pickens ERA is not basically minuscule. It is minuscule. It is. Top five in the country, less than a 1-0-0 ERA, which is even better at home. And already some activity in the Tennessee bullpen. And, and Amanda, we knew that this was a possibility. They wanted to test Charlie Orsini in the starting spot against a dominant Georgia lineup with the option of going to Gottschall on the back end of this start. 
And Riley West also warming up for Tennessee in the bullpen too. I think the goal for Tennessee is to find a way to win this game without bringing in Carlin Pickens oh. to be able to rest her today and ideally start her tomorrow in game three. Emily Digby fouling off the bunt attempt. Corner infield drawn in as they have been for the first two batters of this inning for Georgia. Two on and nobody out. And that pass gets past Kutsoyanopoulos. And both runners advance. Chambly to third, Kuma to second. Well, and it's just so surprising because Kutsoyanopoulos is so sure-handed back behind the plate. Coach Karen Weekly feels like she could put her in any defensive position, calls her a defensive wizard. Caught last year for the first time. Also see her at first base, she can play the outfield, so can play a lot of different positions, and usually you don't see this from her. Wild pitch for Morsini. So we've seen a pass ball and a wild pitch in the inning already. But I'll be honest, I think this has to do more with Orsini not hitting her spots rather than being a reflection of Cut Soyanopoulos, who's having to react to Orsini being just a little bit wild. In the right field, tailing towards the line, and it's a fair ball. One run is in. Here comes Kuma from second. It's a two RBI triple for Emily Digby. This is exactly what Georgia needed. Doesn't just seem like just for this series, but needed for SEC play, needed for to get back into feeling good about their year. Digby, the freshman, we were just bragging on her, their home run off of Pickens, and now a triple against Orsini to get Georgia on the board first. And most importantly, get those two runners in. The past couple of series, Georgia has been leaving a lot of runners on base. She drives in two, and the freshman steps up again. And before the series was one for her last 12 at the plates. And we will step aside. George Knoxville, Sarah Gordon at the plate, takes a strike from Peyton Gottschall. Gottschall, the senior and who we expected to see start game two, but short leash on Orsini and Gottschall enters into action. And she's going to throw a curveball on both sides of the plate. To me, that's what makes her very unique. She can throw her backdoor curveball inside to righties, as well as an outside curveball away from them, too. Added an off-speed, worked really hard on that pitch in the off-season to get it down. Gordon, a flare, left side, playable, and caught in foul territory. Too close to home for Digby to tag, and West records the first out of the inning. Mentioned that curveball, she'll also work an outstanding rise ball that she gets a lot of chase on, a lot of whiffs on as well. You can see her curveball and rise ball has been used the same. The percentage of pitch usage from 2023 to 2024, but that change up a slight uptick has helped her give a slightly different look this year. But that curveball and her rise ball are her go-to pitches. Curveball she throws about half of the time, both sides of the plate again. And that rise ball is a pitch that has seen the batting average against it lowered this year. Which has been a consistent theme throughout this Tennessee pitching staff. Again, learning life without Ashley Rogers, pitcher of the year last year. They've looked pretty good without her this season to start. Armistead handcuffed, pops it behind home and foul. Yeah, they've been able to figure out life without Ashley Rogers, who had thrown so many innings for them over the course of her career and had been so dominant. And they did a good job last year of getting Carlin Pickens' time in the circle as a freshman, who was the SEC Freshman of the Year, and Peyton Gottschall was a transfer, got her into the mix a lot too. And she gets a strikeout on the outside corner. Two down as Armistead heads back to the Georgia dugout. Peyton Gottschall has the mindset that can enter into any situation when the pressure is on late in the game, early in the game. She wants a ball at all times, and she can make pitches when she needs to. Gets Armistead looking on that curveball right at the knees. Upstairs to the leadoff hitter, 
At the top of the order for Georgia, Lindy Ray Davis, who went down looking against Charlie Orsini in her first at bat. Digby at third, a 2-0 lead for Georgia. Both runs scored in this inning off Charlie Orsini. And what can you say about Emily Digby? Had struggled mightily at the plate early in the season. And if you would have told me she'd be the bright spot offensively against this Tennessee pitching staff, I don't know that I would have believed you, but Tony Baldwin told us he's been so proud of her competitiveness at the plate in spite of it not resulting in hits, Amanda. And there is just a little bit of a learning curve when you play SEC opponents every weekend, multiple times a weekend, obviously in a three-game series, and she's handled it well, told her to stay positive. Swing and a miss, strike three. Gottschall comes in and strikes out two. They had that long win streak that was the longest in the nation, and they're on base, plus slugging went up, and they started to hit a lot of home runs, 41 home runs in the month of March. 21 and 1 had just a standout march. Sophia Nugent at the plate for Tennessee. When you do a deeper dive into that win streak, some of their numbers are video game esque. Outscoring opponents 148 to 21 during the 20 game win streak. Well, and to me, when you dive into their analytics a little bit more too, it's just they showed more patience from March to February, or excuse me, from February to March. They started to take a few more pitches, work counts a little bit more. Like the amount of times that they swung at the first strike went down by about 10%, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you're able just to work the count deeper. You're not swinging at as many first pitches just in general, whether it's a strike or not. You're able to work the pitcher, go deeper into counts. Lead off walk for Sophia Nugent. Second walk issued today by Madison. Wow. But the pitching staff was phenomenal too. <laughs> I mean, when you're only giving up one run a game and your defense is playing lights out behind your pitching, you're good. too if you're Tennessee with how well that you've been hitting the ball as of late you, you just don't panic getting down by two runs and I think that if you're Karen Weekly, that's why maybe you feel like you can start Charlie Orsini and see how she does and you're okay if hey if you know she gives up a couple of runs that we can bring in Gottschall and we have the offense to be able to come back and Tennessee has also put themselves in a position to be up at the top of the SEC and winning game one of the series where they feel like they have a little bit of room to play, a little bit of wiggle room. I believe Sophia Nugent was just called out for leaving early, but we're going to take another look at this here. Karen Weekly getting an explanation from Cameron Ellison. Wow, that's really close and probably why Karen Weekly jumped out of the dugout. Yeah, you see, yeah, by about maybe a quarter of the arm circle, she's off right there when Kerpix's ball is in the back of her circle. So I, I just am a little bit shocked because we've seen <laughs> runners get called out leaving early uh, under review when they go back and look at the video review. We've you know gotten a little bit used to that, but seeing it called in live action, we just don't see it <laughs> very much. So. Nugent, bit of a mental mistake there to leave early. 2-2 Two -two count. Fly ball, backhanded it short by Armistead, and now two down after the leadoff walk by Nugent was wiped away. 
your right fielder, number one, Haley Baylor. Katie Taylor at the dish. Base is empty, two outs. And Taylor, another player who getting a start today in a spot she usually doesn't. Starting in right field, when typically it's Taylor Panel out in right. But Karen Weekly making a couple of changes in the starting lineup this afternoon. Let's really see the depth on this Tennessee team. Yeah. If someone gets injured, then they have options. If you want to play a different matchup, then you have options to plug and play. And we have seen them plug and play. We, we see players this year coming back from last year's Women's College World Series team playing in different positions than they did a season ago. Not just the depth, Amanda, but the versatility. Second walk in the inning. And Katie Taylor extends the inning now for Alana Leach. When they're in offense, it doesn't chase out of the strike zone very often, and that's something that Coach Baldwin talked about when talking about this Tennessee offense, knowing that they're just so good at making you come to the strike zone. Three walks already given up by Kerpix in this game. Well, you talked about home runs being an issue for this pitching staff in SEC play. So have walks. We saw that against Arkansas in a series in which they dropped two of three games at home last weekend. Kiki Malloy, as we referenced an inning ago, out for the second straight game after playing in 210 straight games, wearing a boot. Listed as day-to-day, -day, dealing with a lower body injury. And Alana Leach starting in her place in center field. Yeah, again, something that occurred at practice on Thursday. And, you know, something I think that Tennessee fans and maybe even just softball fans in general can rest a little bit easy, knowing that this was something that just kind of recently happened. I think you see a player like her out, and you maybe think the worst. Like, did she... Has she been hurt and has been playing through something and it got worse, but hearing that she just got injured on Thursday at practice and looking forward to having her back as soon as she heals up a little bit more. One, two to Leach. In the center, tracking it is Chambly, and that ends the inning. Kerpix pitching around two walks. Hurts of the field. Batting 347, coming off a third team All-American season a year ago. Yeah. Lifts a foul ball down the line and out of play. The interesting thing, too, is that Tony Baldwin told us coming into SEC play, she was feeling a little bit down about her performance at the plate, maybe not living up to the standard that she set for herself. And they had a conversation, a man, and they said, listen, remember what you did last year? You were hitting the exact same at this point last year, and you ended up third-team All-American. This one is playable and caught on the run by Riley West, one away. It's a tough lineup to go up against when you have to face Sarah Mosley, followed up by Jada Kearney. So many seniors in this lineup for Georgia. A ton of experience led really by their seniors. Returned about 
of their RBI and home runs from last season. And even 90% of their innings pitch. So this is a Georgia team with very high expectations, especially when you think of Georgia, you think of their offense and have so many returners and so much power returning from last season. Kearney handcuffed and popped up to first. Two down as Pooney puts it away. Well, the spring foot. Peyton Gottschall came into this game with nobody out and a runner at third base in the second inning and has done nothing but deal since getting into the circle. Has stymied this Georgia lineup and has settled everything down after a two-run triple by Emily Digby. Has good one down in the count 0 2. Uh, Peyton Gottschall, um, Karen Weekly says, has the personality that players love to play well behind her. They love to play hard for her. See her smiling, having a good time, but also this balance and mix of just this intenseness about her, too. How about another strikeout? A 1 2 3 inning for Peyton Gottschall. Goes up. And the two teams picked atop the polls in the preseason voting. Tennessee and Georgia. And the Bulldogs lead it 2-0 as we start the bottom of the third. Second time through the order here for Laura Miller and this Tennessee lineup. Yeah, and the points total were really close for both of these teams, too. Only one point separated Georgia from being in second place in the preseason voting compared to Tennessee being that preseason favorite. But both Georgia and Tennessee got six first-place votes each. Well, and both bring so much back from really successful seasons last year. Obviously, Georgia falling before the Women's College World Series, Tennessee making their eighth appearance in the World Series. But both teams bring back strong cores. And for Tennessee, yes, you lose Ashley Rogers, but you bring back two pitchers in Gottschall and Pickens, who pitched last year in the World Series, plus six outfield starters for a team that won both the regular season and conference tournament titles. And it's interesting, too, because these teams didn't face each other last year whenever Tennessee won that SEC championship. So not a lot of familiarity with each other's pitchers, really, because Shelby Walters transferred from Duke. Her first season with Georgia was last year. Lily Backus transferred from UNC. And so Tennessee hitters have not seen them, just like Georgia hitters had not seen Pickens last year as a freshman or Gottschall, who had transferred in. You miss one year playing each other. I mean, <laughs> with the transfer portal and great recruiting classes, things change drastically. That is a great at bat by Laura Miller, a full count, and drills one up the middle for a leadoff single. Laura Miller is just really settled into this team. Hit that ball hard. Makes way now for Zeta Pooney. Tennessee atop the conference right now at 9-1, their lone loss to Auburn. Start of the year 8-0, their best start in SEC history. And what I find so impressive about that, Amanda, is that they're doing it while ex being expected to do it. And you played in this league at Texas A&M. You know how hard it is weekend in and weekend out playing with those expectations. It's a lot. Definitely can start to weigh on you. How did you manage that as a player? 
Just try not to think too far ahead, being where your feet are. I'm surprised to see that eight no start to SEC play was the best start in school history to SEC play. With as good as their teams have been, particularly. I mean, very high expectations for both of these teams with a lot of veterans, upperclassmen that high, have such high expectations for themselves, for their team, for each other, don't want to let each other down. Up the middle and through to center field. Back-to-back -back base hits on line drives up the middle. And now tennis. Chelsea Wilkinson, the pitching coach for Georgia, out there talking to Madison Kerpix about how do we move forward. And Amanda Allen coming in to pinch run at first base for Zeta Pooney. Kerpix will remain in the game. Sixth Tennessee base runner aboard today, but none have gotten past second base. Kerpix has done a nice job pitching around base hits and walks this afternoon. Back is warming up for Georgia in the bullpen. Got the start last night. Oftentimes see her at least two, maybe even three times in an SEC series. Which just has to be incredibly difficult because you get batters like we have here in the SEC seeing you two and three times in a series, multiple times in a game over that stretch the adjustments that they make. Dallas, good night, holding her hands up after that pitch in center field, and has a great view in center field, by the way. Just wondering, where was that pitch? How did we not get that call? Gibson in the left field. They will wave the runner in from second base. It's Mailer sliding in at home safely. And Tennessee on the board. McKenna Gibson coming up again in game two. Three hard hit balls back to back to back. The three hitters who have come up to the plate. Two on and nobody out now for Riley West. Dangerous spot for Kerbix. West, oh, what a play at third base by Sarah Mosley on a rope. One down. These balls are all flying off the bats of Tennessee in this inning, and Sarah Mosley had such small time to react, didn't even just keep it in front, but being able to get an out on that crushed ball, so important for Georgia in this inning to finally get an out. And Tony Baldwin just popped out of the Georgia dugout. He might be seeing the same thing you are. And she throws a good drop ball on both sides of the plate. Rodriguez, a fly ball to Kearney in right field. Tagging up from third is Allen, and she will score to tie the game on a sack fly by Destiny Rodriguez. Tennessee wasting no time to tie up this game. First pitch, Walters brings to the plate. Rodriguez understands. Runner at third base, less than two outs. My job is to get something to the outfield. Sack fly for Rodriguez. Two down and a runner at third for Nugent. So many weapons 
on this Tennessee team. Amanda Allen comes in to pinch run at first base and scores a couple of batters later. Karen Weekly pulling all the strings right now in the third inning. Her team tying it up. Well, and I think it's their ability to score in a lot of different ways, mm -hmm. too. They're able to have patience when they need to, to draw a walk. Then they're able to hit early in the count, just get a ball to the outfield, and they air to tie up this game with a sacrifice fly. Home run power. They lead the SEC in SEC play in terms of home runs. And conversely for Georgia offensively, you and I have talked coming into this series that they have lacked that ability. And Tony Baldwin has emphasized that as well. We can't just be a home run hitting team and expect to win in this league every single weekend. Well, the momentum has just completely shifted to Tennessee pretty mm. quickly. I feel like it's been ever since Gottschall entered the game and shut down Georgia when they were still threatening. Nugent pops it up and caught by Walters. That ends the inning. But Tennessee plates two. Thanks for your time. You know, your team from the start was making solid contact against Madison Kerpix, making the adjustment in the third inning to get some runs across the board. What did you see differently second time through the lineup from your team? You know, the result was we strung some things together. And that's what you have to do to score runs. And I thought we just had a healthy sense of urgency about us. Like, you know, we're, we're doing some good things and we're nice and loose, but it's time to kind of get down to business and put some runs on the board. Coach, what does Peyton Gottschall bring to your team entering this game with her energy and just the way that she pitches overall? She has a competitive fire to her and an energy like you see it when she plays, and it really inspires everybody. And she has that really healthy kind of, hey, I'm just going to throw my best pitch, and whatever happens, happens, that, you know, you, you like all athletes to have, and some of them go their whole careers trying to get there. And she's a great model for that for everybody. Coach, appreciate your time. Good luck the rest of this afternoon. Thank you. And she's been throwing a lot of strikes since she entered. Take on Sydney Chambly for the first time this afternoon. And the cool story about Karen Weekly getting Peyton Gottschall to her team is that she actually pitched against Tennessee in a tournament in 2020. And whenever she was at Bowling Green and she struck out 13, Karen Weekly said. So <laughs> she knew at that point I remembered her. And if I said to myself, if I ever see her in the portal, she's someone that I want to take a look at. And Karen Weekly had told us last year, whenever it was the first year she had joined Tennessee, it was pure luck that I just happened to see her in there so quick. And contacted her and got her here. Current leader in career strikeouts among active Division I pitchers. And to your point, Karen said, listen, when you have players transferring up a substantial level, there's always that outside chatter of, well, will it translate to the SEC? Boy, has it ever for Peyton Gottschall. Slow roller back to her and flips it to first, has retired all seven Georgia batters she has faced. It's that mindset, Coach Weekly said, is just unbelievable. And last year when she came into the team, she called her a breath of fresh air in the bullpen with that mindset that she has. And also she, she said that Peyton Gottschall helped the other pitchers on staff not get too caught up in winning and being perfect. So it's not just her great curveball, that backdoor curveball that she just threw right there that makes her so great, but she's just a great teammate. She's a great member to have on your pitching staff. She makes everybody else around her better. And oh, by the way, she can spin the ball like crazy. 
and bringing that change up this year that she just threw right there. Look at her. She's like, yes, I just got that pitch. That's exactly what she's thinking, what she's feeling, what she's saying right there, a pitch that she didn't necessarily have as much as she wanted to last year, worked hard on in the offseason. Getting to throw it more now. Just missing for ball one. Look at just her energy in the circle. She's so fun to play around. This is that changeup that she threw for a strike. 59, 58 miles an hour. Back to back tappers to the circle. Two down in the fourth. We'll have the SEC Equestrian Championship for you Monday night, 9 Eastern, 8 Central. And in case you missed it, all of the best moments for the Hildebrand Equine Complex in College Station, Texas. Auburn came in as the five-time defending champs. It's right here on the SEC Network and the ESPN app. telling you that backdoor curveball that she just threw to Emily Digby right there, right at the knees, inside corner. It just is such a different look, Matt. You just don't see a lot of pitchers that can throw that pitch the way that Gottschall can. Throws it back to back right there. Digby takes it twice. And all of a sudden, Gottschall is ahead 0-2. It's looking good in this inning. Has set down nine in a row. Her fourth strikeout. Much appreciate your time. All three runs your team has scored in this series have been produced by your freshman, Emily Digby. Just take me through the growth that you've seen from her in just a short period of time as a freshman. Yeah, she's just she's a good softball player. And, uh, you know, she's a consistent thinker. She doesn't get too high or too low. And so, uh, you know, that allows her to be a pretty consistent player. And, you know, she's drinking from a fire hose here in the SEC, but uh, she's holding her own. And uh, she's been a game changer for us on the defensive side of the ball. And, and then she's come up with some pretty timely hitting. So really proud of her. Coach, with Gottschall entering this game, what's the, what's the message to your hitters? Yeah, we just got to play better. We got to play better on all three phases of the game. We're not pitching well enough, playing defense well enough, or uh, having good enough at-bats versus the level of competition that we're playing. So we got to buckle up here and, uh, you know, play a little better. All right, Coach, appreciate your time. Good luck this afternoon. Thank you. Tied at two, and it's Shelby Walters coming back into the circle. Remember, it was Madison Kerpix who got the start, Amanda, and you referenced it right off the jump. Even though we didn't see the results from Tennessee in the first two innings, they were on top of her, whether it was drawing walks or making solid contact. Got her out of the game in the third, and now... It's Walters taking on the bottom three in Tennessee's order. And it's just so interesting how the feel of a game can change because right now it feels to me, right, like as a fan watching this game, it feels like Georgia is losing. But it's a tie game. <laughs> it's the score is 2-2. It's essentially we're starting a new game. But you could tell, and I think that, you know, we should mention, you could tell that, Coach Baldwin is not happy with the way that his team is playing. And he mentioned all three facets of the game, defense, up at the plate, and in the circle. But the best part is that at any point in a game, you have a chance to turn it around. It's Mosley at third. One down here in the fourth. And just something seeming just a little bit off with Georgia the past couple of weekends. And remember, this is a team that returns 97% of its production offensively last year. A core portion of its pitching. So for you, Amanda, who do you look to? in a moment like this where, as you mentioned, it feels like we're losing. The energy is in favor of one team right now, and it's not Georgia. I look to whoever is in the circle right now. The, the game and the feel of the game starts and ends in the circle, and that's why you see Tennessee having so much success in SEC play and being up with the top of the SEC standings because their pitchers are bringing it weekend in and weekend out. They're just not taking any pitches off, any at-bats off. So right now, 
Shelby Walters has a chance to keep her team in this game, to be the one that sets the tone to say, hey, we're not just here to show up. We're here to win this game today and get back into this series. Well, Tony Baldwin says Shelby Walters is a pro in the circle, can hit all the quadrants, executes her pitches really well when she's on. They need more of that here in the fourth. Tennessee plating both of their runs last inning. And more soft contact. Two down. Exactly what Georgia needed. So that gives way to Alana Leach. Again, starting in center field in back-to-back -back games for the injured Kiki Malloy. And if you're just joining us, Malloy dealing with a bit of an injury, suffered in practice on Thursday. You see her there in the dugout wearing a boot. She is day-to-day. -day. And it is not serious enough that they don't expect her back in the lineup soon. Well, and Alana gets to wear the quote-unquote family number in the Leach family. She gets to wear number 10, which is a big deal in the Leach family. <laughs> Aubrey Leach was an All-American here who also played at Tennessee. Just a lot of softball players in the Leach family, but 10 being the common denominator. And her twin sister Gabby wears 55 because 5 plus 5 equals 10. And Gabby got to wear 10 in high school. So it was Alana's turn. That's good sibling sharing right there. I mean, that, I think that's just what you have to do. But they do call it the family number, by the way. 3-1 to Leach. And then you also have to give a shout out to a former player who played at Tennessee, Megan Gregg, who also wore 55. So 55 is a little bit in honor of Megan Gregg, but also a little bit in honor of the family number of number 10. What's in a number? <laughs> a lot, apparently, for the Leach family. <laughs> what about you? What number, number did you wear? Nine, but one all throughout my career until I got to college. And why nine? Uh, because one was taken. <laughs> yeah, so you just you do a little shift, and then she graduated, and I still was like, no, no, I'm just going to stick with number nine. I don't want to – I want to stay loyal to this number. I don't want to jump around. So it's not always that deep. No, Sometimes yeah, it's was... just your number's taken, and what's the next yeah. best number that you like? I think maybe looking for a single-digit number yeah. that was available. I like nine. That's sharp. It's a good number. Yeah. Some numbers retired out in left field. Gorgeous day for softball at Sherry Parker Lee Stadium. And this, oh, you have more to the story. Yeah, no, I'm I just have looking this, at your I face have this right one now. more thing that I want to get in. All the Leach sisters played for sudden impact, and obviously they couldn't all be 10. So Aubrey was 10, Kelsey was 20, Alana was 30, and Gabby was 40. So increments of 10. And a lot of leech pokes it over the head of Jaden Goodwin. Rounding second, and she'll stay put. It's a two-out double for number 10. <laughs> See, because she had a great at bat, we got to talk all about her number and her softball family. And then she gets to win this at bat with a double. Not a great read out in left field by Jaden Goodwin. She came in on that, and it just flew over her head. And now Leach turns over the lineup with two outs, and Laura Mueller, the leadoff hitter, gets to come on up. Wearing increments of 10 is just, that is incredible, <laughs> incredible loyalty to the number 10. <laughs> Here is Laura Mueller, who has already singled in this game, came around to score back in the third. And we have seen this Tennessee lineup one through nine produce today. All but two batters have reached safely, be it a base hit or a walk. 
I was talking about Shelby Walters in the circle and trying to get that momentum back. The first two hitters come up. She gets two quick outs, and then Leach has that long at bat. It's going to be, and this is one of those at bats where it's just the bottom of the fourth inning, but so much is riding on this at bat to see what Tennessee is going to do with that two out double. Mueller batting 400 this year with runners in scoring position. 2-2. Two -two. And calls time with home plate umpire Scott Mayer wants to chat this over with Karen Weekly. Laura Mueller transferred over from MTSU and Coach Weekly noticed that she'd hit two home runs off the Alabama pitching staff and Saw her in the portal and brought her in and maybe played the Tennessee girl, you know, so maybe early on the season, maybe wanted to prove herself a little bit too much, but not worrying about that as much anymore. Just going to go out and play less pressure. Full count to Miller. And Miller goes down looking. A big time strikeout to end the inning by Shell Rowe since entering the game back in the second inning. And she now takes on Sarah Gordon for the second time through the lineup. And quickly ahead in the count 0-2. And that just feels like it's been a theme since Peyton got into this game. Going after hitters and aggressively getting in the head, getting ahead in the count early. That's a word that Karen Weekly likes to use a lot in all parts of their game. It was just that aggressive mentality, but Gottschall working to get ahead. Line drive into left field at the wall and gone. A home run for Sarah Gordon. And Georgia takes back the lead. That got out in a hurry for Sarah Gordon. Big time hurry. And this is a big time mistake by Peyton Gottschall. Talked about how she's being aggressive, was working from ahead. This is an 0-2 count changeup that just stays flat about belt. Look at the location of this pitch, about belt high. And Sarah Gordon says, thank you. I'm about to put that over the left center field wall and give my team the lead. Mega swing by Sarah Gordon. This is a Georgia team that likes to rotate back behind the plate. Sarah Gordon gets the start today. Puts our team on top. And it's a Georgia team that on a fly ball to the left side, caught by Laura Mueller, one down. It's a Georgia team, Amanda, who used the home run ball a lot, not only last year, but early this season to build leads, to take over games. We haven't seen it as much in SEC play. That is a big home run for a lot of reasons from Sarah Gordon. And now it's Lindy Ray Davis. Back to the top of the order for Georgia. That home run just makes such a statement to the Georgia team. And we were just talking about Shelby Walters and hey, what's it going to take? Well, it's going to take Shelby Walters shutting down Tennessee's hitters and had that two out double by Leach, but then Walters took the game into her own hands and look at what that did for the Georgia offense. And it just takes out that one swing to be so contagious for the rest of the lineup and everybody else that comes up. That everybody else now steps up and thinks, I can do that too. I can build off of what you just did with that AB. You thought that was a strike. It was a really good pitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
Two, two and two to Lindy Ray Davis. One down, nobody on. And a full count with Sarah Mosley awaiting on deck, who has been one of the more dangerous hitters in the SEC throughout the entirety of the season. Leads this team and runs batted in. Three, two, high fly ball, shallow center field. It's Leach, two gone. Number 10's having fun out there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here's Mosley, 0 for 2 today. And 0 for 4 in night one with two strikeouts. Well, and what that home run did, it was off of a changeup, but it just puts a little bit of doubt in the back of Gottschall's head with that pitch now. She was rolling with that pitch, able to throw it for a strike early in the count. And that first one that she throws to Mosley, now it's a little bit lower. And now it's a little bit lower to where that's a ball instead of a first pitch strike. These little, little tiny things within a game add up to big things throughout the rest of the innings that we have left in this tight game. Tony Baldwin told us when we chatted with him last half inning, we have to play better in the circle, at the plate, in the field. They've executed on two of those since that conversation. Walters with the shutdown strikeout to end last inning with a runner in scoring position for Tennessee and then the home run by Sarah Gordon taking the lead back for the Bulldogs. Well, and we've talked a lot about the seniors and the returning players, but the couple of players who have stepped up in this game offensively for Georgia have been new faces and Digby the freshman and Sarah Gordon the transfer. Start to feel like if Gottschall goes back to that rise ball, it's going to be up out of the zone. Mosley can be so good at taking that pitch and getting her barrel to it. Just a close take there. That looked a little bit off the plate. I'll give it to Mosley. It's a little bit, <laughs> a little bit inside by a couple of balls. Good spot though, but knowing that you got to be careful with Mosley, just like that last pitch location. Mosley fights off the 3-2. 50 pitches in the outing for Peyton Gottschall. And remember, retired the first nine batters she faced for Georgia. Looked unhittable until that mistake to Sarah Gordon, resulting in a solo homer. Eighth pitch of the at bat coming. And Mosley lifts it into left. Riley West, gloves for out number three. Georgia takes the lead. Walters misses low to Zeta Pooney, who is one for one this afternoon. A single, a walk, and a run scored. Part of that two-run third, which included three straight singles for this Tennessee team. Well, when we started out this game, Matt, you said it, is that it just starts to kind of feel like a must win for Georgia. Yeah. And I think that you can sense it in a lot of parts of this game, even going back to Tony's interview when we talked to him and his in-game interview, you could just tell that I think he feels that too. And it becomes a must win just because you really, you want to win, but you just want to see your team play the way that you know that they're capable of playing. And I think that's the biggest thing, especially with the expectations and the senior-led talent that Georgia has on this team. And respond from a series loss at home, a place that they've been really good this year until that series loss to Arkansas. A series in which, as you referenced, many people thought Georgia was going to win. They were surprised that the Razorbacks came into Athens 
and one. Walters with a strikeout, her second for the final four. Oh, look what I found. Says Shelby Walters, two down. Off-speed pitch that Gibson reads out of the hand and is just on time with. Bad luck for Gibson because Walters just gets her glove to that line drive. Great reacts. After that pitch was released, you can read the bat path of the hitter and you just kind of expect it as a pitcher. Be more prepared for it. A one to Riley West. Backhanded at first, bobbled momentarily by Digby, but takes it to the bag. Nine pitches in a now Tennessee, a game and a half ahead of the Gators, who go into that series seven and two in the league. How good is college softball right now, and particularly the SEC, Amanda? Yeah, it's going to be a good one tonight. And two different teams. Florida is really young, a lot of new faces. And LSU is really old, a lot of faces that have been there for a really long time. And Allie Newland for LSU is having a great year. Raylene Gutierrez also having a great year. We talk a lot about Taylor Pleasance, and everybody knows her name. But there's players stepping up on LSU's team. That has just been a complete team effort with really, like I said, old team. They're kind of old like Georgia. <laughs> These players have been there forever. Seasoned. Seasoned, Seasoned yes. players. Yes, I think that's probably experienced the best way to say that. One, two to Kearney. A vet in her own right for Georgia. Has singled already once in this game. And somebody that has the power to change the complexion of a game with one swing of the bat. And speaking of LSU, Jada Kearney told me that a couple of players that she looked up to when she was younger was Alex Hugo, who played at Georgia, but also Bianca Bell, who played at LSU. She said she used to watch LSU all the time when she was little. The 2-2 from Gottschall. Handcuffed, flared to short, and Miller is there one away. And both pitchers we've seen, Shelby Walters and Peyton Gottschall, induce a lot of soft contact in the air since they both entered this game a couple of innings ago. Goodwin goes after the first pitch. One of just two Georgia hitters who has not reached base this afternoon. Trying to change that here. In the top of the sixth, Georgia looking to bounce back after a 5-1 loss in game one last night. And a series loss against Arkansas last weekend. This would be huge for Georgia to pick up a game two win. A tough place to win at here no in doubt. Knoxville too. Tennessee has had a lot of home success. They get great crowds. They feel obviously very comfortable at home. Have those new seats out in right center too. That Scottshall gets a strikeout. But this ballpark has just really grown and transformed over the past few years. But I love the way that they've kind of just started to bring everything in and the outfield with those stands in right center, the party decks in center field and then also in left field. Did a nice job with this ballpark and just letting it grow up a little bit. Add some lipstick to it. <laughs> More renovations to come as well with the Players Clubhouse. Part of a two-phase renovation to this ballpark. I think you're starting to see that more in college softball is putting seats, putting places to stand behind the outfield because the sport is just growing so yeah. much. And you love to see that. I mean, you look at what OU did with Love's Field in their first year, and they have literally, I think, a couple of thousands of seats behind the outfield. 
And then even how the Women's College World Series has grown so much too with expanding the seating in Oklahoma City, trying to get in 10,000, 12,000 plus fans. Plus you get the added ambiance of an occasional train going by in left field. It's almost like those black wall things kind of block the train a little bit now. Well, we're told that Tony Baldwin really likes those Ooh. tall black windscreens and uh, might have some ideas for adding those in Athens. Not to be outdone, of course. And the party deck, too, I think he really likes, which, you know, they're getting a renovation right now they are. in Athens. So Beautiful one. We've got some room to play there in the outfield, too. Here's the one, two. And it's upstairs for a ball to Sydney Chambly, who has singled and scored already in this game. Part of a two run second. Georgia took the lead early. And then Tennessee tied it with two runs in the bottom of the third. Before a Sarah Gordon solo homer gave Georgia the lead. And it's three and two to Sydney Chambly. Another hard at bat here by Georgia. And a big time strikeout, the sixth of the game. For and the middle part of the order due up for Tennessee. Destiny Rodriguez, Sophia Nugent, and Julia Kutsoyanopoulos, the three do ups this inning for the Lady Vols, who have yet to lose at home this season. Both of these teams have played challenging schedules too. And unfortunately for Tennessee, they've had quite a few games get canceled this year. In fact, they've had six games get canceled. Which is a big chunk That's of your schedule. That's way too many. That's a lot of games. All for weather. All for weather. Against quality competition too. Well, it's an affected their strength of schedule a little bit, particularly when you look at canceled games against Florida State, UCLA, and Baylor. Those are all top 25 RPI teams. And all out-of-conference games that bolster your NCAA tournament resume on a ground out to short. One away now for Sophia Nugent. Well, Georgia has played one of the toughest schedules in the country, too. And maybe even Tony Baldwin had said coming into the season, maybe one of the toughest schedules that they've ever put together in Georgia program history. Knew that this team was experienced and older and wanted to challenge them, as well as wanted to try to work toward getting a higher seed than what they got last season whenever the bracket came out. Had to travel to Super Regionals and go and play at Florida State, who would then go on Florida State would to play in the finals of the Women's College World Series, so just a tough draw, but you feel a little bit better about your draw when you are a top eight seed, when you are able to host a Super Regional instead of traveling on the road. That was one of the big wins for Georgia this year, beating Florida State after Florida State ended Georgia's season last year in the Super Regional. And you referenced Georgia's resume, top 10 in both strength of schedule and RPI. Nine wins already against the top 25. That's why they're working so hard to get a win here against Tennessee. That would be a top 10. Yeah! Um, to center and caught. Bouncing off the wall is Sidney Chambly. Tracking it like a heat-seeking missile. What a play in center field. 
actually Dallas Goodnight out in center field and they missed her a little bit. She was injured, didn't have her a few games for a few games, but got her back in the midweek game and tracked this ball back and then just gave in to the wall, knowing that when she hit the warning track, it was going to be there soon. That ball was hit so hard off the bat. She had a great read, and that out was exactly what Georgia needed. That play was what they needed in the inning. And now quickly 0-2 to cut Soyanopoulos, who has yet to reach base this afternoon. Everybody up on the Tennessee bench. Atop the SEC coming into the weekend at 9-1 after the win in game one last night. Definitely little stars that I put in my scorebook next to some key moments. And of course the looking strikeout that Walters had to end the bottom of the fourth inning to Laura Miller with the runner in scoring position was one. The Gordon home run after that to give Georgia the lead. But I'm starring that Dallas goodnight play right there as well. And a slow roller back to Walters. Another one to that one. A legend. Whose jersey's out in left field. That's right. I feel like her Jersey is a little bit everywhere, sprinkled all throughout this place. It's some Monica Abbott here, some Monica Abbott there. Opportunity here for Georgia to get some insurance against the Tennessee team that will have Katie Taylor, Alana Leach, and Laura Mueller do up next inning. And with as dangerous as Tennessee's lineup has been this season, and especially in SEC play, another run or two would be huge for the Bulldogs. Kuma, fly ball to right. It'll get out of play and foul. Kuma has walked and scored in this game so far. Second team All-American a season ago. Hard grounder to second, it's Rodriguez to first, one away. It's crazy how a game has a, the potential to come down to just one mistake, right? And and you do look at that one 0-2 pitch that got Shaw through, that Gordon hit out, that gave Georgia the lead as the one mistake. And certainly there are other little things and big things too that happened throughout the game, but back to that mistake and kick yourself if you're Gottschall with the way that she's thrown today. That one mistake has been it, but it's been a big one up to this point. And the play of this freshman, Emily Digby, this series has been spectacular. Pops it out to third, but has produced three of Georgia's four runs scored in the series so far. And you referenced Sarah Gordon. This was the home run that gave them the lead back in the fifth. This was it. A changeup that just missed out over the plate. Sarah Gordon on an 0-2 count was thinking, thank you for putting that there. Because the way that she's been spotting up that curveball is just looking perfect, actually. And it takes a lot to say that because it rarely feels like you have a perfect day with a pitch. But her curveball on both sides of the plate today has just been spectacular. There it is again. And strikeout number seven for Pate, the seventh with Katie Taylor. 
And she looks at a first pitch strike from Shelby Walters, who has set down 11 of the 12 batters she has faced in this game. And throwing that off-speed pitch effectively through the zone and got Katie Taylor to chase that one out of the zone. It's going to cause hitting coach Chris Malvo and also Karen Weekly to talk to Katie Taylor about it. Walters has retired seven straight. The contact that we have seen Tennessee make against her has been soft for the most part. Aside from that Alana Leach double, the lone hit today for Tennessee against Shelby Walters since she entered the game in the third. It's a good take by Katie Taylor. That pitch looked like it kept the corner. Looked like it easily could have been a called strike, but the call goes in the favor of Katie Taylor. The one, two. Taylor whiffs, strike three. One down in the seventh for Shelby Walters. Goes with the off-speed pitch here, drops it down to 60, gets a little bit of down movement and away movement from Katie Taylor. Shelby Walters, you can just tell, she wants this win. And now here is Alana Leach, who doubled in the fourth. Both pitchers that have come in relief of this game, Gottschall and Walters, have just done a tremendous job. Walters has just given up one hit. Gottschall just given up one hit. Difference is that one hit Gottschall has given up is, is a home run. It begs the question, will we see Walters tomorrow for Georgia? She has been the best pitcher in this series far and away for the Bulldogs. Got to get the win here first, though. 2-0 to Leach. It's a great question and one that I don't even feel like I can answer right now for Georgia because I'm sure Tony Baldwin and the staff want to hash that out, knowing that tomorrow, if they hold on to this lead, they can win a series against Tennessee, going for the series win. Leach takes strike two. Most importantly, though, right now, you just got to find a way to finish. Laura Miller on deck for Tennessee. 2-2 two, two just misses. And it makes the count full now to Alana Leach in just her second career SEC start in the place of the injured Kiki Malloy. And Leach goes down swinging back-to-back -back strikeouts to start the seventh for Shelby Walters. Yeah, Off-speed pitch, the pitch before made this outside fastball at 71 just look like gas. Good at bats that Leach has put together against Walters in this game. Leach had the double before, and this time in the seventh, Leach wins. Excuse me, Walters wins. Miller struck out in her first at bat against Walters. And Walters has set down nine in a row since. To be so careful knowing that one miss, one home run could tie up this game. Tennessee has hit the most home runs in SEC play this season so far. Miller with seven of those. Down in the count, one, two. And the 18 game home winning streak for Tennessee hanging on this next pitch. The one, two from Walters. Just missed. Two 
Karen Weekly's club, a perfect 13-0 in this stadium this year. The 2-2. Strike three called. Walters with three straight strikeouts in the inning to pick up 